thank you very much. And uh, what we'll be talking about today is uh, actually over 10 years. It's more like 15 years of, of work in Florida, uh, with also a little bit of uh, parallel work uh, in both those areas, fragmentation, microfragmentation, and now also sexual reproduction success in Mexico. And if you want to learn a little bit more about that, there's a poster out in the poster session that gets the, the timeline of that uh, um, Mexico project a little better. Well, everybody's seen this picture, or pictures like it, where you have an arrow going from the left to the right of what the briefs used to look like, and in some places, or too many places, what they look like now. I think coral restoration's really um, big challenge is to literally turn that arrow the other direction. I'm going to show you a couple of success stories where that has taken place, which is really something nice that gives people hope. Well, there's a number of different uh, uh, types of stressors, as everybody knows, but leaching disease and hurricanes were probably the biggest factors in most of the uh, corals lost from, from both uh, the Florida Keys as well as the Caribbean and New Mexico. And uh, people sometimes ask me, well, why do you bother growing coral to put it back out if it's just going to die? And the reason is, is that, that we can actually have a phenomenon called basically natural resiliency. We look at this uh, uh, elkhorn coral here and uh, see a bleaching event. You can see that part of the coral, or a separate species or genotype of it, has bleached and the other half hasn't. And within a few months later, uh, the same sort of thing that actually that bleached one died, but the other one didn't. Regretfully, we went from, in the Florida Keys, from 25 to 40% uh, coral cover to now about 6 to 12%. But the corals that are there have the natural resiliency that they made it through our 70s and 80s, the times when we had some of our bigger and back-to-back -back bleaching events. So we're utilizing those rootstock of the resilient species to just make more. Well, there's a number of things, as everybody can uh, tell, that you can do to do coral restoration. You can try to solve the problem, which is uh, mostly lowering the CO2 emissions. The other factors like water quality. You can make marine protected areas, or you can do something more proactive that has been coined by uh, Buki Rikovich of uh, actually active restoring and growing corals. Well, how do you do that? Well, most people have seen some of the pictures of the staghorn corals. We have, we have two aquaforest species in the Atlantic, as opposed to 100 or 200 in the Pacific. And those two species were the first two to get into trouble. But they were also the species that was very easy to uh, propagate. Coral trees has evolved from things from s just starting with cinder blocks or concrete blocks to the famous uh, uh, tree method used now, and just utilizes a field nursery to literally break or fragment it and have it grow very fast. And everybody's probably seen this, but it's, it's fast growing. These are uh, some of the pieces coming off the tree one month old, five months old, seven months old, 11 months old. So quickly, within a year, actually producing a half <coughs> You can see some fish in there already. And it is, it's, it's a wonderful um, method. It's, it's what uh, actually our organization uh, produces as far as about half of our coral restoration for outplanting. But since there's 28 species of corals in, in Florida, only two are the acroporids. The rest of the 26 species are the massive corals, and no one is, not very many people are, are working with it. There's over 38 programs of coral restoration in Florida and the Caribbean wide. 36 of those 38 are just doing uh, field nursery with, with staghorn corals, and only a couple are doing a land nursery like we are, and the ability to do the other 26 species of the massive corals. But normally they grow really slow. Uh, like the uh, uh, David Galco uh, talked uh, previously yeah. in the earlier session, uh, a coral the size of this table is anywhere from 75 to 100 years old. It's growing only a millimeter a month to a couple millimeters a year. So it's very difficult, and it's very difficult for something that has not evolved, like the branching coral, to break and then refragment on its own during a storm and regrow. 
So this is very, very hard. So um, since that's such a hard subject, I'd like to just switch it and say, well, let's just talk about sex. Then. <laughs> and by sex, you've seen, luckily, uh, Eric's uh, talk ahead of this, and many others, uh, talked about the whole cycle of coral spawning. And coral spawning is really what has been the success of the advancement of really most of those other massive species. A uh, spawning event of once in the summer, uh, only uh, maybe production of about a million eggs, and only one in a million actually makes it maybe every 10 to 100 years, because they live for many, many years. Well, we decided to utilize that uh, technique, not, not to be able to do like CCOR, of saying this is the problem to solve in order to plant corals, uh, during this method, but we use this method actually to give us something that normal fragmentation has a problem with, and that is by fragmenting the same genotype over and over again. And we're using uh, sexual reproduction to get us new genotypes. And uh, our first time was actually about 15 years ago uh, when we made our first uh, discovery of being able to do by as I call it, the first 11 test tube babies of the Elkhorn coral. And uh, this is what the size they are in just one to three months. Three to six months, the size of still a little bit bigger than a head of a pin. A year or two old in the size of a small coin. And when this happened, I got very disappointed in it that it was too slow a process. It was three years old before it was the size that started to put up the horns to even look like an Elkhorn coral. I took it off the aquarium, put it on the bottom of the aquarium, and forgot about it for six months, and then went to move it. And like any good acroport, it had grown itself onto the bottom. I went to move it, and I broke it to hundreds of little pieces, and I thought they were all going to die. And instead, this silly mistake became the start of microfragmentation, which stimulates them to grow very fast. I quickly took a, a, a scalpel and started the science of cutting them again, and. Uh, with that species, it worked out very well. So the beginning of microfragmentation happened, but then looking at all the other 26 species, and uh, my colleague uh, Christopher Page's uh, challenge was to look at each one of these to see if we could, how small we can make the fragment and how many species it works with. And luckily, it works with every single one of them. So instead of our typical way of making about uh, 600 corals in six years, we were producing about 600 corals through mi microfragmentation in just one day. And we were running out of tanks and space, so we usually put our corals a couple inches apart because they would have a half a year to a year to grow. But instead, uh, they grew together because they were so close. So the large fragmentation method is what we used for the first six years. It was basically a very big tile saw cutting it into the size of a golf ball, waiting two to three years till it got big again, and start over. The new method uses that uh, nice uh, diamond blade saw where we literally can take one of these pieces and cut it into 20 to 100 microfragments. And it stimulates them to grow back to the size in as little as four to six months. Besides growing back fairly fast, uh, we're producing large numbers. And so we were running out of space but producing the economy of scale. As shown here, the first few years of, of uh, our production numbers and what it is by adding microfragmentation, uh, we actually produce about 50,000 corals during this method, so it is scalable. And just this last year, we planted 20,000. We'll be doubling that number next year, and this does not include our staghorn production, which is twice that. So, by this time next year, we'll be in the production of about 100,000 corals, both grown and planted. So it is scalable. The amazing thing that we discovered was the one on the left is corals that have just been fragmented. The one on the right are a little bit older than six months, and you can see that they touch each other, but instead of fighting, they're actually fused back together because they all came from the same parental piece. So we follow each of our genotypes. And what we do now is plant the genotypes next to each other, utilizing the natural reef. Regretfully, there's just no <coughs> uh, lack of dead coral heads that are out there in the wild. We find a coral head of the same species that has basically been deceased. And then we plant in, a, in an array uh, the number of pieces of microfragments. And in just a short period of time, uh, they grow over. Here's a, just a quick shot of four pieces put down. 
And this is it just a, a half a year later where it's completely grown together and fused into a colony that would have taken 15 years since it's done that in under a year. We call it coral fusion. We used to call it uh, resheeding because it extended out. Too many of my Spanish friends mispronounced it. <laughs> <laughs> this will show you, this is, a, this is Acropora palmata. Uh, we can cut it into as little as one or two polyps. And this is, uh, these 12 shots are the beginning shot, and this is actually just 11 weeks. So you can see it filled and fused in 11 weeks. So that I think would be a nice time lapse shot. So in the field, we're doing the same thing. We take an array, place some of the same genotypes together. You can see it on the left starting to grow. This is it just uh, two years later on the right. Not a very good shot, but you can see it's 98% fused back together. That's a, an array the size of a large pizza. And, uh, and, and that would have been a 25 to 75 year old coral, and it was done in two years. So uh, we're, we're looking to go bigger and better. Uh, last year we planted a coral head the size of a Volkswagen uh, with 250 pieces. In two years we expect it to be uh, better. And just last week we did our first large bombing. This is a, a coral head that is actually four meters across and five meters tall. And we're planting, and in fact, in one day, we planted 1,000 uh, identical fragments on there. In two years, we're going to bring back a 1,000-year-old coral back to living on, a, on its old skeleton. So it's kind of unique, but let's get back to the sex part again. Um, and uh, the first year we did it, we got you know 11 elk horns, and Chris has a green thumb. And in 2013-14, we were getting more like a couple dozen. Now we regularly get a few thousand. And this has been allowing us now to have a total of almost 10,000 new genotypes. And that will help to make uh, Mother Nature just decide which ones of these are going to be the best uh, diversity in genetics for surviving. We also can have what's just basically a, a small uh, sample of uh, a simulator tank that uh, basically we can also adjust pH and temperature and see between all of these new genotypes which ones of these may be better uh, established for the future 20, 50, or 100 years from now. And so if you haven't done it already, there's a couple neat things. One is microfragmentation. One is uh, the ability of uh, fusion back together. Uh, uh, the other thing that I didn't mention is these corals actually somehow start acting like an adult. When we make them in two years the size of a 25 to 75 year old, they sometime, somehow tell each other they are start to be acting like mature, and they've actually spawned in as little as an 11-month-old that would have taken 15 or more years. You put all these together, and you basically have uh, the ability to, I'm going to go back to this, uh, look at a genotype, test it in the lab, grow it up, cut it into fragments, bring it back up to size and mature, and literally be able to make crosses of new genotypes within the life cycle of a graduate student. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just wanted to throw this in there. Besides microfragmentation, doing it with uh, Lisa Carnes down in Fragments of Hope, but without a nursery, we planted the microfragments directly out on the green and they're surviving just from being cut on a, on a dock. And uh, that area actually has shown that turnaround of that arrow to what it used to look like to what it looks like now on the right. And the same sort of thing in Mexico, just going to give you a quick view. This is what it, one of the beautiful reefs, what it looked like. Then uh, Hurricane Wilma turned it into this. Now that would have taken many years to come back, but with just 4,500 corals using microfragmentation and regular fragmentation, as well as sexual reproduction, uh, that they have been implementing that. This is what it looks like today. With just uh, five years, 4,500 uh, corals planted there, and by the way, um, it is the one million visited reefs, and with just 4,500 corals has been brought back to something great. The new governor of, uh, of the UK TAM ran on the premise that if he won the election, he would plant a coral for every vote. He's got 262,000 uh, votes, and he's put that much money into trying in the next two years of planting that many. So it is possible. And with economy of scale, we can plant and grow a million corals in less, for less than two to ten dollars a coral. We can do that and scale up to a million in literally one year if you have enough space. And I'll just leave it with what 
we need to do to plant that scale. And it's basically aquaculture production in the millions, cost to produce the moving down, and making sure that permitting does not restrict the first two. There's a lot of things with map monitoring data and those type of things, but I'm going to jump right down to the bottom. Two, stop making scientists plant corals. That's why the cost is so high. This is a farming operation. And I would just suggest get started on what's available now and then keep improving those in the future. Thank you.